Good morning, everybody. We'd like to start. Maybe if you can come a little bit closer, that will be better. And we'll give the new people who arrived to sit in the back. Um, dear Dan David Laureate, dear faculty member, dear student and dear guest, and ladies and gentlemen, it's really an honor and privilege to open this uh, special uh, symposi symposium on memory and mind, biological and digital. Uh, part of the Dan David uh, Prize. The Dan David Prize, as you know, is already given for the 13 years. It's uh, been becoming a world-known and prestigious prize. And usually the prize is composed of three dimensions, past, present, and future. And luckily the theme of the present prize was memory in mind. And this is exactly the daily life of the Sagol School of Neuroscience. We deal with uh, neuroscience and brain, and investigate brain function and dysfunction. And we are happy to have you today in the present dimension, which is uh, on the title of Combating Memory Loss. Professor Brenda Milner, Professor John Hardy, and Professor uh, Peter St. George Hislop. Thank you for coming. In the future dimension, which was titled Artificial Intelligence, we have Professor Mavry Minsky. And I think that the, the, uh, the nice thing is that these two dimensions interact with each other. There is memory formation, memory loss, and then artificial intelligence that might help us maybe to create new memories. And on this, on this frame, uh, we have decided the School of uh, Computer Science and the Sagol School of Neuroscience to have this joint symposium that will deal with uh, these uh, topics from different, di from different direction, from the direction of memory formation, memory loss, and artificial intelligence. And this is part of an ongoing activity that the School of Computer Science and the School of Sagol Science has, and uh, it's been uh, reflected in the last year new program for bachelor degree that we opened which is psychology and computer science, which give the student the ability to have both information from the world of psychology, biology, and computer science, and to investigate the brain from different direction. And this is a part of the idea of the Sagol School of Neuroscience, which is bringing researchers from different directions. We have 100 researchers coming from seven different faculties, including computer science, and this is, I think, uh, the idea of bringing researchers to investigate the brain from different directions. We're going to have a very busy day. We'll have uh, four lectures by the laureate and a few lectures by faculties of uh, Tel Aviv universities. And during uh, lunch, we'll have poster by, presented by student in the uh, foyer. And a, a part of this uh, uh, posters, uh, a special section, will be posters of students that are supported by Teva Company. And Teva initiated the launches last year, a very uh, powerful program, which is called uh, NNE, National Network of Excellency. And the idea is to support research in brain science. And we are very happy that Tel Aviv University won many of the prizes of the fellowships, and the students are going to present their work during lunch. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Yoav Hennis, the Vice President for Research and Development of Tel Aviv University, to greet you. Please. Uh, Dan David, the Prize uh, Laureates, Professor Hardy, Professor St. George uh, Hislop, Professor Brenda Miller, Professor Marvin Minsky, uh, dear Tel Aviv researchers, students, and guests. I'm uh, honored uh, to open the Dan David Symposium on Mind and Memory, uh, Biological and Digital. Our brain is made up of millions upon millions of neurons which communicate in complex ways which are still a mysterious unknown.
Understanding uh, the brain and the integration of its activity into what one may call mind is an ultimate challenge which is at the frontiers of modern biology and medicine. It is important not only for understanding how this most complex of organs functions, but also for, the, for diagnosis and development of novel treatments of many devastating neurodegenerative diseases which have uh, multiple effects on modern society. These important aspects uh, were clearly evident in the Dan David uh, Prize this year, in which uh, four laureates actually uh, deal with uh, various aspects of brain and mind uh, research. I truly hope that the current emphasis on brain research will lead to novel understandings of brain and mind and to future development of uh, therapeutic approaches. I wish you all a wonderful and interesting symposium with, and a lot of success in your uh, future uh, research for the benefit of science and society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hennis. And I would like to call uh, the co-chair of the session, Professor Nahum uh, Dersovich from the Computer Science School to introduce, uh, to welcome the ambassador. Please. Good morning. It's a sublime honor to call upon His Excellency, Mr. Matthew Gould, the British ambassador to Israel, to greet this symposium. Mr. Gould has been British ambassador to Israel since September 2010. Over these years, he set up the UK Israel Life Sciences Council and also the UK Israel Tech Hub, as well as the 10 million pound Britain Israel Research and Academic Exchange Partnership in regener Regenerative Medicine. Earlier in his career, Mr. Gould served as Private Secretary for Foreign Affairs to Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and as Chief of Staff to two foreign secretaries. His diplomatic postings include Washington as Foreign Policy Counselor and Representative of the Joint Intelligence Committee, Iran as Deputy Head of Mission and as Acting Ambassador, Pakistan just after 9-11, heading up the Embassy's political section, and Manila as the political officer, where he was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire for having set up a program of cooperation between British and Philippine police and detectives for tackling child abuse. He also established a unit of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to help combat forced marriages around the world and, its victim, and aid its victims. Mr. Gould speaks some Farsi and some Hebrew, though I suspect he'll speak here in English. He read philosophy and theology at Peterhouse College, Cambridge. Before that, he spent a year teaching English and mathematics at a secondary school in the tribal trust lands in northern Zimbabwe. He has published a scientific paper in the journal Sociobiology entitled The Frequency of Termite Isoptera Damage to Tree Species in Namakutwa Forest, Tanzania, on termite feeding preferences in the dry coastal forests of Tanzania. Not only is Mr. Gould a longtime patron of the sciences and of British Israeli cooperation in the sciences, and a scientist in his own right. But furthermore, all three present time laureates are British, making his gracious presence at this symposium particularly apt. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Nahum. You've done me an enormous honor. I have to say most of all by um, lying to the audience and saying I'm a scientist. Um, it's incredibly kind of you and actually one of the nicest things that anyone said about me since I've got to Israel and I will treasure that. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today for both personal reasons and professional reasons. I will come on to the professional reasons but let me start with the personal um, and that is um, I stand in the very, uh, one, the re, one of the reasons that it is so nice to be speaking to an audience of doctors and people active in the field of medical research is I place myself very firmly in the Jewish tradition 
of hypochondria. Um, indeed, this very morning before coming here, I went to, to see my doctor. Um, and on a number of occasions, I have diagnosed myself with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, and so it'll be a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce our experts in the field. It does all those, though, remind me of my favorite uh, Jewish joke. And having a, an audience like this is too good an opportunity to miss telling it. And it's this, you, there, are, uh, there is an Englishman, a Frenchman, and a Jew lost in the desert. And they're crawling along. They're exhausted, and the Englishman says to himself, I'm hot, I'm tired, I must have a pint of beer. And the, the, the Frenchman is crawling along and he says, I'm hot, I'm thirsty, I must have a cognac. And the, the Jew is crawling along and he says, I'm hot, I'm thirsty, I must have diabetes. <laughs> the the honour of speaking to you today is afforded to me by the presence of not one, but was as mentioned three um, of the um, Dan David laureates. Um, and it's for me a, a, a sort of fantastic uh, honour for the UK that so many of our scientists should be, should be honoured in this way. Just to run through them, Professor Hardy is the most cited Alzheimer's researcher in the UK, the fifth most cited internationally, was the first to discover a mutation in the amyloid gene, um, which plays a key role in the neurodegeneration associated with Alzheimer's. We have Professor St. George Hislop, who by discovering two genes responsible for early onset Alzheimer's, has made early diagnosis and treatment of a disease possible, often before brain damage occurs. And then we have Professor Milner, whose work has led to many landmark discoveries in the study of human memory and the brain's temporal lobes. And Professor Milner obviously is here from McGill University, but as she very proudly showed me her British passport, I am very proudly going to claim her as a British recipient, and the Canadian ambassador isn't here to tell me I can't. Um, the Dan David Prize is, as was said, divided into three categories. And this year, all three are devoted to the common theme of memory and what many now regard as the final frontier of science, namely the mind. The category of the present, devoted to researchers combating memory loss and neurodegenerative diseases, is particularly of relevant to the UK um, because this quiet crisis of um, memory loss, um, dementia, uh, neurodegeneration is perhaps one of the most pressing socio-medical issues of our day and has been made by our Prime Minister David Cameron a very personal priority. And he called a, a summit on the issue at 10 Downing Street not very long ago that one of the, the laureates today was present at. And I mean, we estimate the global cost of managing dementia exceeds $600 billion a year. But more than the cost to the world's economies is the cost to hundreds of thousands of families who have the extraordinary pain of losing loved ones slowly to dementia. And that is a huge personal burden. And we believe that Britain and Israel are very well placed to collaborate on this issue. Both countries excel in neuroscience. Both countries are the home of pioneering work in the field, new drugs, innovative ways to, uh, to tackle the challenge of dementia. And it's a, a source of real pleasure and pride to us that Teva has now committed to a three-year dementia research program, providing funding of a million dollars for early stage work in the UK. And it's also a source of real pride to us 
that the British Neuroscience Association is teaming up with the Israeli Society for Neuroscience and announced a joint symposium on dementia, which will be held later this year in Elat. And all this is coming at a time when the relationship between the UK and Israel in science has never been stronger. And, I mean, it was very clear to me when I became ambassador that the potential for this relationship is huge. And we are both, as my foreign secretary and boss put it, scientific superpowers. We both have disproportionate numbers of Nobel Prize winners, disproportionate numbers of world-class universities and world-class laboratories. And there is so much more than we can do, that we can do together than we can separately, that it seems to, to us a, a crying shame that we're only just starting to ful fulfill the potential of this relationship. And for me, as ambassador, there's no better model for how I want the relationship to be between the countries than the model of collaboration between our scientists. Free from politics and focused on making progress for the benefit of all humanity. That for me is a very pure and rather wonderful model. And so it's no coincidence that when my boss, the Foreign Secretary William Hague, came here last, the very first thing he did was to go to Hebrew University and sit down with the Israeli science minister and sign a memorandum between Britain and Israel to promote scientific collaboration. And that memorandum set out four priority areas for our research, of which one is neuroscience. And it's also no coincidence that when his boss, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, was here just a few weeks ago, he, with President Shimon Peres, did an event to promote our collaboration in science and met a series of Israeli scientists doing very exciting work with the UK. And so it's a real pleasure for me as ambassador to be invited to help open this symposium and honour the three British recipients of a Dan David Prize. And I just wanted to leave you with one thought, or rather three thoughts, that have struck me about this symposium. Um, because I think there's something very special about what you're doing today. The first thing that I thought was special was its extraordinarily international aspect. This meeting of minds to discuss the mind brings together scientists from all across the globe, not just Britain and Israel. And I think you are broadening more than just scientific horizons today. And I think this is a wonderful example of the power of science, science and scientists to reach across international borders. The second thing which I think is very special is the interdisciplinary nature of what you're doing. And looking at the lineup for the speakers today, it's very striking how your discussions are pulling in people not just from the faculties of medicine, but from computer science, and nanoscience and biological science and psychology. And I think this is something very important because the ability to transcend the traditional barriers and silos of scientific disciplines and reach beyond into other areas of expertise requires real dexterity. But the rewards for doing so are huge. And as the Jewish saying goes, who is wise, he who learns from every man. And then the third thing, and the last thing that I'd say about what you're doing today, is just to point out the cooperative nature of this symposium. It's quite rare in my experience to have a symposium like this, which makes so much effort to make itself open and accessible, not just to the scientists who are taking part, but to members of the public as well. And so the overarching message that I'm left with is that this symposium shows that science is for everybody. Not only that it affects everyone, but that contributions can come from everywhere. So I wish you all 
a very successful and fruitful symposium. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the great words and description of this event. And I would like to uh, call Dr. Danny Frankel to introduce the first speaker. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, audience, I'm very happy and honored to present Professor John Hardy. Professor John Hardy is the head of the Department of Molecular Neuroscience and Chair of Molecular Biology of Neuro Neurological Disease at University College London Institute of Neurology. Professor Hardy was the, was the first to discover a mutation amyloid gene encoded the amyloid precursor protein, which plays a key role in neurogeneration associated with Alzheimer's disease. His research interests are in the genetic analyze of the disease. Historically, he was working on the genetic analyze of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. More recently, he focused on Parkinson's disease and, and other movement disorder and motor uh, neurons. His research aimed to develop an understanding and the underlying uh, genetic of the disorders, both in understanding disease mechanism and to help the search uh, for treatments. With over 23,000 citations, Professor Hardy is one of the most cited uh, Alzheimer's disease researchers in the world. In recognition for his uh, exceptional contribution to science, he was elected as a member of the Academy, Medi Academy of Medical Science and of the Royal si uh, Society of London. Professor Hardy received numerous distinguished uh, awards and honors, among them uh, a Potamkin Prize for American Academy of Neurology for Alzheimer's Research, the Khalid uh, Iqbal uh, uh, Award of Lifetime Achievement in Alzheimer's Disease Research, and the IFAD uh, Prize for uh, Alzheimer's Research. Professor Hardy, I'm very honored to invite you to give a talk. It's it's a real pleasure to be here today. I've had a great trip. My wife and I have had a great trip uh, here to Israel. We've s seen great hospitality and, uh, you know, been around the country. It's a beautiful place to come to. I've really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to the Israeli-British uh, uh, neuroscience meeting later in the year. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, whole genome analysis of Alzheimer's disease uh, and really I think I've got a couple of messages really. The first is that through this we're beginning to trace out the pathways uh, to disease. The second is really to show you how uh, genetic analysis has become so much more powerful over the last uh, five or ten years and now allows us to uh, really approach any uh, disease uh, area um, um, uh, in a systematic fashion and find uh, the genetic risk. So what I'm saying, although of course I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, is applicable to other neurodegenerative and neurological diseases but also applicable to, to diseases across the, across the spectrum. This is how we think these days about uh, genetics. Uh, this is, uh, if you like, a, a graph of how we think of genetic risk. On the left-hand side at the top here in blue, if I could, yeah, it's a bit difficult for me to see, but here, these are what we think of as genetic diseases where there are rare, they're rare in the population, this is frequency along this axis, but if you have these variants, you will get disease. This is the risk here. We've been able to find this type of genetic risk for 20 years uh, in a systematic fashion by the process of positional cloning, which I'll show you uh, in a second. Uh, so this is a this type of genetic risk we've been able to find for a very long time, a very, very long time. But as I'll describe, we can now find it much quicker than we were able to in the past. Down here in the bottom right, this is normal genetic variability. Um, there's about 200 people in this room. This is variability that 40 or 50 of us in this room will have, but it only influences our, our, our risk of disease by a relatively small amount between 1.1 and, and twofold. So these are small effects on risk. 
uh, um, that are present in the population. Uh, and we've been able to find these, as I'll show you, um, in a systematic fashion for about the last five or six years by a process called genome-wide association studies. In these studies, we test genetic variability across the genome uh, for association with disease. We do essentially 500,000 chi-squared tests for genetic variants across the, uh, stepped across the genome uh, for risk uh, disease, to disease. So we can find this type of vari variability systematically as well. In other words, we can, if, if it's there, we can find it. Finally, in the middle here, this has been the most difficult area, and this is just about uh, 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 sol soluble as well now. This is variability that perhaps one or two of us in this room will have, so it's rare, but it doesn't cause disease, but it massively increases your risk of disease. The, so this is so rare that we can't really find it through association studies, and yet it does not lead to extended families um, with disease, because I might have the gene and the disease, uh, but my father had the gene but didn't get sick, his mother had the gene and did not get sick, but her sister might have got the, had the gene and got sick. In other words, it doesn't inevitably lead to disease, it just increases your risk. This type of variability uh, we can now find through sequencing a whole exome, that's all the protein coding parts of the genome, or whole genome sequencing. So every part of this curve we can now uh, find, the, find the risk in a systematic fashion. The other, the other point that I'm going to draw out as we discuss the genes is that wh whatever the type of risk these genes um, uh, uh, encode, uh, what we're beginning to find is that all the genes for particular diseases map to relatively few pathways. In other words, as we find the genes for disease, what we're really doing is uh, identifying the biochemical pathways which are important in the pathogenesis of the disease. This is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Here you see the plaques made up of the amyloid peptide, and then these string, stringy bits are, ta are tau, uh, uh, tau filaments, uh, uh, phosphorylated tau. So this is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, which underlies the clinical features of the disease. And really, I think that modern work on Alzheimer's disease started with a pair of papers uh, from Glenna and Wong uh, in 1984. In the first paper, Glenna isolated the amyloid from a case of Alzheimer's disease. And in the second paper, and this is the second paper, in the second paper, he took a brain of somebody with Down syndrome. People with Down syndrome have long been known to get Alzheimer pathology when they reach their 40s and 50s and got the sequence of the amyloid peptide from there as well and noted it was the same and wrote the abstract, which I'll read, the amyloid protein from a case of adult Down syndrome was isolated and purified. Amino acid sequence analysis showed it to be homologous to that of the amyloid peptide of Alzheimer's disease. This is the first chemical evidence of a relationship between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. It suggests that Down syndrome may be a predictable model for Alzheimer's disease. Assuming the amyloid peptide is a human gene, it suggests that the genetic defect in Alzheimer's disease is on chromosome 21. All of that uh, is essentially true and implicit in what Glenna said is that he clearly thought that overproduction of, of amyloid uh, was one route to getting Alzheimer's disease because of course people with Down syndrome have got three copies of chromosome 21 whereas the rest of us have got two copies and he is implicitly suggesting that people with Down syndrome simply get Alzheimer's disease because they may, make too much uh, amyloid. And that is really the basis of the amyloid hypothesis of the disease. 
This is a very old slide now. This is um, uh, the, from the paper that was uh, mentioned, Finding Amyloid Mutations, and I show it because it explains how we, in general, find genes which cause Mendelian autosomal dominant disease. And uh, what you're looking at here is a grandfather with Alzheimer's disease. If I can move grandfather with Alzheimer's disease, two sons with Alzheimer's disease, both dead. These two sons married two sisters, uh, and these... Uh, okay, I'll use a pointer here. These, these, these five uh, people with Alzheimer's disease inherited the top part of the chromosome, uh, as did their cousin uh, here. These all got sick. But crucially, these two individuals here, uh, this individual did not get sick and got the top bit of the chromosome. This individual here did not get sick and got the bottom bit of the chromosome. So the simplest explanation is the disease gene must be between here and here. <coughs> there are about 30 genes in this interval, but one of them is the amyloid gene. And when we sequence the amyloid gene uh, in this family, we found that these individuals uh, had an amino acid change. So this, is, this was the uh, work that was referred to. This is the amyloid mutation causing disease. Now, although this is a very simple slide, uh, um, what this actually shows is 30 person years of work. This took a group of six of us five years to do. So this is 30 person years of work. Now, um, this, this same experiment would probably take a competent postdoc about between one and three months uh, to do because of, the, of the, um, the developments in genetic technologies to do with, uh, n well, of course, knowing the human genome sequence and, and therefore knowing the position of every gene. PCR was not invented at this time. That, of course, helps enormously. Um, uh, and uh, the whole genome arrays allow us to assess all the markers in parallel in the genome. Uh, so we could do this uh, two orders of magnitude quick, more quickly. So this was the, uh, an amyloid mutation causing Alzheimer's disease. That was an amino acid change. The French group in 2006 uh, reported this type of family, which we have now <coughs> identified about eight or ten ver uh, uh, versions of in the UK uh, with amyloid gene duplications. And what you're looking at here is uh, a gene chip analysis of chromosome 21 uh, here. And if, if you can see here, what you're scoring is alleles on this chromosome, A, 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 B, 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 the chromosome is lying along here, but you can see in this part of the chromosome we've got an extra allele. That's because there's a gene duplication here, and the amyloid gene is within that duplication. And this really finishes uh, uh, Glenna's work, in a sense, because this really proves that Glenna was right when he said that people with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's disease because they have an extra copy of chromosome 21. In these individuals, they don't have have Down syndrome, but they do have the extra copy of chromosome 21, and sure enough, they get Alzheimer's disease uh, when they're in their 50s. Another point I want to make then uh, at, this, at this slide is that when you find a, a locus for disease, you find many different variants at that locus which influence risk. So this is one example where you can have amino acid change or gene duplications. I'll come on to other examples uh, later on. So this work al allowed us to formally state the amyloid hypothesis. As I say, it was implicit in what Glenna had said in the 80s. Now, when we found amyloid mutations, um, uh, when we found amyloid mutations, we had about 30 families with early onset Alzheimer's disease. The family I showed you uh, had an onset in the 50s. Uh, that meant that most of our families uh, did not have amyloid mutations, so there must be an other, an other genes, and that the race to find the other genes was run by Peter Hislop, who's going to talk about that, I'm sure, in a few minutes. Uh, and this is, uh, though, uh, the structure of the gene he found presenilin 1 uh, here, and this is the amyloid precursor protein in the active site 
of presenile in one. Every residue in red is a residue at which a mutation has been found which causes Alzheimer's disease. And when Peter found uh, presenile in one, we did not know what its function was. Uh, we now know that its function, one of its functions, is to cut the amyloid precursor protein uh, here. These are two uh, aspartic acid residues. They act like a pair of scissors and they cut the amyloid precursor protein uh, here. Uh, so their function then is to uh, be part of the metabolism of the amyloid precursor protein. And that harks back to what I said a minute ago at the beginning, that when you find different genes for disease, what you're doing is delineating a pathway. And sure enough then, um, uh, the initiation of this pathway seems to be the uh, cleavage of the amyloid uh, precursor uh, uh, protein. Families with amyloid mutations in general have an onset age in their about 55. Families with presenilin mutations uh, tend to have an onset age between about 30 and 50, although there are exceptions to, to those uh, rules. But they, are, but they are otherwise typical uh, in terms of their pathology and clinical presentation uh, of typical late onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. What I've been describing so far are mutations which cause Alzheimer's disease. I said, though, that when you find a gene for disease, what you find is uh, at, the, at that gene you find multiple alleles which are associated with different, uh, 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 different amounts of risk. And related to, the, to that statement was this paper, very interesting paper from the DECODE group, which is a mutation in the amyloid gene which protects against Alzheimer's disease. In other words, the mutation I showed you before in the amyloid gene uh, is one which causes disease. This is a mutation which protects against Alzheimer's disease. And the reason it protects against Alzheimer's disease is it because it inhibits the metabolism of the amyloid precursor protein. And this is important from both a theoretical point of view, but also from a treatment point of view, because this suggests that if you have a lifetime inhibition of the metabolism of the amyloid precursor protein, you have a lower risk uh, of getting uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so this really does um, point the drug companies uh, at, uh, at the idea uh, that they should try and reduce the production of amyloid uh, in, in the brain as a, as a route towards uh, developing therapies for disease. All the families, that, all the, all the families with clear autosomal dominant uh, Alzheimer's disease have mutations in the amyloid precursor protein or the presenilin uh, uh, genes. Uh, all of them. So there are probably no other genes which uh, 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 have a one-to-one -one relationship with the disease. What I'm going to talk about now is the risk variants, the variants that, uh, that many of us in this room will have uh, which are predisposed to disease. Uh, and the, I show these uh, slides because they, they tell a story about how these studies are organized. Um, these are from 2009, uh, uh, and what they describe is uh, huge collaborations where uh, groups from all over the world, this is a, a, a UK-led, uh, this is a French-led, uh, and this is a US-led uh, study, um, <clears throat> with each of them have got hundreds, well, not hundreds, but 70 to 100 authors uh, because they are involve uh, all the groups collaborating and putting thousands of cases and thousands of controls together and then testing for association across the genome. And these are the first, uh, the first of these studies, which were 2009, and they are beginning to uh, yield, as you can see, um, uh, consistent results. So this one found clustering 
and uh, PCALM, and this one found clustering and complement receptor uh, 1. Uh, and as we've gone on now, we're finding more and more uh, uh, genes here. Now, this is the most recent study which came out uh, earlier this year, and you can see that it involves 74,000, uh, the analysis of 74,000 uh, individuals. And as we increase the size of these studies, we find more and more uh, loci involved in disease, and this is that analysis uh, here. Uh, and what you have here is the chromosomes laid out uh, in order along this axis, and then the p-value, uh, the statistical significance here. You're doing about 500,000 uh, chi-squared tests because you're testing so many polymorphisms. So you have to set a Bonferroni correction about here, and everything which exceeds that uh, area uh, exceeds that point here uh, is uh, declared uh, as a gene for uh, a locus for disease. APOE uh, is easily the most important, and I'm sure that Danny Michelson will talk about this. It is e easily the most important. It has an odds ratio of ap uh, for APOE4 of close to 4, and actually it, this is truncated. It would go way through the uh, uh, ceiling here, these other genes all have odds ratios between 1.1 and 1.5. Uh, and um, essentially, um, as we increase the number of uh, samples we analyze, we will continue to increase the number of loci we find. It's a bit boring, though, just to have a list of genes involved in disease. That's uh, a, more of a catalog than an insight. Uh, and, but it is clear uh, that uh, we are, when we look at the functions of these genes, we are gaining insights into, uh, the, um, into the biology underlying the disease. And this just looks at the first eight loci. What I'm saying is true of all the loci uh, whose function we know. Uh, and I'll list them here. APOE, as I mentioned, we know that that's involved in cholesterol metabolism. Clustering, we also know, it, it, the other name for clustering is APOJ. We also know that this is involved in uh, cholesterol metabolism. It's also, it's part of the complement uh, cascade, the innate immune system. PCALM is involved in endosomal vesicle recycling. Um, we don't exactly know the function of PCAM. I think Peter might talk about this, but we believe it might be indirectly involved in amyloid metabolism. ABCA7 is definitely involved in cholesterol metabolism. Its homologue ABCA1 is the gene in Tangier's disease, which is a cholesterol uh, storage disease. Complement receptor 1 is obviously involved in the complement cascade, the innate immune system. BIN1, like PCALM, is probably involved in endosomal vesicle recycling and again uh, might indirectly be related to APP metabolism, though this is not sure. And then MS4AE is uh, involved uh, probably in the uh, complement cascade. So we're beginning to see then that, uh, uh, of course, of the th of, uh, th these are broad categories. The innate immune system is a broad category of gene function. Cholesterol metabolism is a broad category of, of um, function. Uh, and endosomal vesicle recycling is, a is an important and central um, part of uh, cellular metabolism. But these are comparatively small proportion uh, of genes in the genome. So we are beginning to see then that these processes are what is important in Alzheimer's disease. And the genetics is telling us what parts of those processes are key, uh, are key components of the disease. And that is that point which I've made in a kind of anecdotal way uh, is made in a systematic way by this paper from Leslie, uh, Leslie Jones. So we're beginning to see pathways to disease. And actually, if somebody declared a, uh, that they thought that they had found a gene, a locus for Alzheimer's disease, which wasn't in these pathways, I would have a high degree of suspicion that they were not uh, right, because it's, it's turning out to be a very robust 
robust finding uh, across, um, across, uh, across groups. So what we've dealt with then with these forms of the disease, these genes here, amyloid in the pre -senilind. We've dealt with these uh, here, uh, these common uh, variants. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the work that's really only just started uh, here uh, in exome sequencing uh, the genome to try and find these high-risk uh, variants. And last year... <coughs> We were fortunate, I don't know, this is perhaps, I don't know how easily you can see this, uh, we were uh, fortunate in finding, uh, we and the DECO group were fortunate in finding uh, uh, mutations in a gene called TREM2 uh, involved in uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. These are variants which are present in about half a percent in the general population and about two and a half percent of Alzheimer cases. We found this, the, the way that we found this gene and the way that the DECO group found the gene were different. The DECO group looked at the entire Icelandic population and treated the entire Icelandic population essentially as one large family. Uh, and uh, look to see what parts of the genome uh, all the people with Alzheimer's disease shared, uh, which was less often shared by their compatriots. We had came at this in an entirely different way. We had been sequencing rare uh, recessive dementias in the Turkish population. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of consanguinity in the Turkish population, and we had found homozygous mutations in this gene called TREM2 uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Alzheimer's, in, uh, in an early onset dementia in Turkey. And when we looked at the mutations that we had found in the Turkish uh, disease in a homozygous fashion, we then looked in our English Alzheimer series and found we had got the same mutations, heterozygous, in our, uh, in our Alzheimer uh, cases in England. Uh, and that, so we came at this from an entirely different uh, perspective. Interestingly, um, so these papers came out last year. This paper from 1983 actually makes uh, the same point uh, as we had made uh, over, well, nearly 30 years later. Uh, Ted Bird had identified a recessive uh, disease um, with this, which is uh, the same disease we had found in Turkey and had shown that some cases of that syndrome had actually got Alzheimer pathology. And he had suggested that this, this, the, whatever caused this rare recessive dementia was also uh, implicated in Alzheimer's disease. We were not aware of this. You can see, in fact, the disease had changed names, so we didn't find it by a literature search, uh, and uh, uh, the gene uh, for the disease had not been described there. But te uh, Tom wrote to me very politely when our New England Journal paper came out and said, nice finding, shame you were 30 years late um, with it. But it was a nice letter, though. So the nice thing about TREM2 uh, is that we actually have a good, I uh, a good idea. I emphasize it's an idea a good idea of its function. Uh, it's a microglial uh, gene, and its role, role seems to be in a, holding microglia in a phagocytic phenotype. When microglia are uh, exposed to something like amyloid, they first try and engulf that, um, the amyloid, that, that's their phagocytic uh, role, and when that process fails, uh, they switch to an inflammatory process pump out cytokines to bring other microglia into the vicinity. And TREM2 is one of the um, uh, receptors which holds the microglia in this phagocytic role. So its, uh, its role at this point is phag phagocytosis. And so at this stage in Alzheimer's pathology, there is amyloid in the brain, but that amyloid is not provoking uh, a catastrophic reaction, uh, tangle formation, and cell death. What it is doing is that amyloid is being engulfed and dealt with by the microglia. When this fails, 
then it switched to cytokine production and to an inflammatory response. And the, it seems that if you have only one copy of TREM2, it makes it more likely that your microglia will switch from the phagocytic role to the cytokine and inflammatory production uh, role. And so this is likely to be a key part of Alzheimer's pathogenesis. I should say that people have been saying that inflammation, that, um, that um, microglial activation was important in Alzheimer's disease for something like 30 years. Uh, what this shows, really what these genetic findings show, is that genetic variability in that process is key in determining who uh, develops uh, disease and who manages to maintain uh, uh, their amyloid deposition without, um, without uh, having a catastrophic uh, reaction to it. So this is now where we're up to echoing that first uh, review slide. We've got all of these genes down here. These are the GWAS hits. APOE4, easily the uh, largest effect, APOE4 homozygosity here. Here we have the Mendelian uh, genes uh, here, which I've mentioned, amyloid and presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. And then this is TREM2 here. And we've actually just subsequently found another gene, PLD3, which is also uh, in this uh, area here and probably involved in amyloid uh, production. So we are beginning to fill in this, uh, the, if you like, the architecture of, of risk for Alzheimer's disease. We've got a lot more genes, I'm sure, to find, especially in this area here, but I would suspect that those will continue to map to the pathways we have already uh, been discussing. So these are the lessons we have can draw from uh, Alzheimer genetics. The Mendelian genes are all involved in amyloid production. There's also protective variants, and these reduce amyloid production. The risk maps to definable pathways, including the innate immune system and the, the complement system. Some of the genes appear to be amyloid response genes, and I would put TREM2 in that. Endosomal recycling genes may be involved in amyloid production. This is an area of research. It's not absolutely... Uh, did, uh, absolutely certain yet that that is the case and I would say that all of the genes are consistent so far with the amyloid uh, hypothesis first expounded uh, by Glenna all those years ago. Thank you very much. Shall I take questions? So I no. Okay, you can ask questions at the coffee break. So I'm, I'm humbled to introduce Professor Peterson George Hislop. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Peterson George Hislop uh, is in, at the uh, Wellcome Trust Principal uh, Research Fellow at the Department of Clinical Neuroscience, University of Cambridge, and Director of the TAN Center Research in Neurodegenerative Disease in the University of Toronto. He was the first to discover key mutations in proteins involved in the early onset of Alzheimer's disease and implicated in late onset of this disease. A, a Peter St. George Hislop has won one of Europe's top health awards for his pioneering work on the roots of neurodegenerative diseases, including the Bial, I hope I'm saying it correctly, a merit award in medical sciences. Among his honors and awards are the Francis McTone, I hope I'm saying it correctly again, prize from the Canadian Neurological Society and an award uh, for medical research from the Metropolitan Life Foundation and distinguished scientist. Uh, he won several more awards and he's also a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a foreign member for to the Institute of Medical of the National Academy of Sciences and a, follow, a fellow of the Royal Society of London. Please. Let me begin by, by first of all saying what a tremendous honor it is uh, to be awarded the Dan David Prize. 
um, I think my colleagues were equally surprised as I was by being told that we'd won this prestigious prize. And it is truly a, a great honor. Let me um, now tell you a, a short story in the next 40 minutes or so about the biochemical genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And in choosing this story amongst all the other stories that I could have told you, I decided on this story not only because it's a nice, long, scientific, technical story that goes all the way from humans down to uh, almost atomic detail, but perhaps more importantly, as you will see, it tells a human story. And I think the human story may in fact be larger than the actual scientific story itself. Specifically what I'd like to do is to show you how the analysis of an obscure illness in a Russian Jewish family led to the discovery of the Priestland genes, which as John Hardy told you a few moments ago, is one of the key players in the biology of Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to show you some data to convince you that the Priestland proteins form a membrane-bound protein complex with several other proteins, and that this complex uh, functions as a very unusual enzyme that cleaves membrane proteins within the transmembrane domain of those proteins in the lipophilic environment of the membrane, which is, I think most physical chemists would tell you, is almost a biological impossibility, and yet it does in fact occur. I'd also like to show you uh, that uh, this precinin-dependent cleavage of these membrane proteins, particularly key substrates like the notch protein, is essential for life all the way from very archaic bacteria all the way up to humans. This protein complex is indeed a vital machine. I'd also like to show you that aberrant cleavage of one of the substrates, the amyloid precursor protein, as John Hardy told you a few minutes ago, causes the most aggressive form of Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I'd like to show you the technical details of how structural biological investigation of this precinin complex has begun to show us how the machine actually works at almost an atomic level to cut these uh, substrate proteins. And this knowledge, with a bit further refinement, should allow us to eventually design very substrate-specific drugs that act to prevent the cleavage of amyloid while still permitting the, the necessary cleavage of the other substrate proteins, such as Notch. So the story begins in 1844 with the birth of Hannah. We don't know exactly where Hannah was born. It was probably either in Vilnius in Lithuania or Riga in Latvia. What is known is that she spoke the Lithuanian dialect of Yiddish, which means that she and I could not have spoken to each other. In her 20s, by presumably a traditional Jewish marriage, she was married to Shlomo, who was born and lived in Bobrusk, in what is now Eastern Ukraine. And initially, they had a happy marriage, and they gave birth to nine children, some, not all of which, are shown here. But at about the age 40, Hannah began to develop memory problems, and survivors of the family who knew her recorded that at about the age 40, she became forgetful, then she began to uh, have difficulty looking after herself, and many of her children recall that they had to wash her hair, feed her, etc. And the symptoms that they describe are the symptoms that we now see of a patient with classical Alzheimer's disease. However, that wasn't the only affliction that happened uh, to Hannah and her family. There was an attempt, or actually a successful assassination of a Tsar of Russia, and what followed was a hideous series of pogroms. And initially, Hannah's village was not visited by the pogroms until 1891, when one came to her village. The village was essentially destroyed, and in the melee, uh, the fear, the terror, Hannah, obviously unable to understand what was going on, 
suffered a massive cardiovascular collapse and died. She was buried that night in the garden to prevent desecration of her body. And the family moved away to another village. However, they did not escape the further uh, pogroms that happened again between 1903 and 1905. And these ones were particularly vicious and nasty. And the family decided to have a diaspora and to move away. First one or two of the sons, then several of the daughters, and eventually even Shlomo himself moved away to the United States. But they didn't move as a single entity and they didn't move to the same place, but instead moved throughout different parts of the United States where they had the typical immigrant existence and where things initially seemed to uh, uh, perk up. However, some 10 or 15 years after their move from the uh, Russia, uh, the disease occurred again, affecting five of her nine children. At first, it wasn't clear what this disease was, but eventually a very bright uh, young man, a, a great-grandchild of uh, Hannah herself, uh, called Ben, had become a medical student and became fascinated with why it was that his uh, uh, mother and his grandparents and uh, other relatives who he'd heard about had come down with this disease. And so he managed to acquire some brain tissue from one of the affected members of this generation here and looked at it and realized that in fact she had what we now know to be Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, all of these people who came down with the disease died and then there was a period of respite again until the 1950s when once again this disease reappeared in the next generation affecting 10, gen 10 grandchildren. And this went on and eventually, in, uh, the next generation came to the age of about 40. They too started to develop the disorder. At this time, Charles was becoming quite old and handed on the uh, 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 sort of family uh, uh, responsibility to Charles, who was also a pathologist. And Charles uh, continued the tradition of keeping in touch with the family members that were scattered throughout the United States. He continued the tradition of uh, uh, archiving the stories of each of these people and wherever possible acquiring post-mortem tissue. And eventually in 1980 uh, um, uh, 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 some additional members now in, in this generation uh, started to come down with the disease. And one of them went to see Dan Pollan at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester who began to care for this patient. And by a, a serendipitous accident Dan happened to hear a lecture that I gave about uh, how one could use recombinant DNA technology to map genes causing uh, uh, diseases. And so he suggested that I come and talk to him about this family and see what could be done. And that started the next generation of investigations. But by this time, by the 1980s, there had now been 28 cases of Alzheimer's disease in the five generations that we knew about here. So in 1985, the hunt began, and with uh, about seven years of work in 1992, we were able to, to report that the gene causing Hannah's disease was in fact mapping to this small region here of chromosome 14. At that time, however, we had no idea what the actual gene itself was. And so the next step was to try and clone the gene from that region of the chromosome. And as John Hardy told you, this is a very labor-intensive approach in which one has to clone each uh, uh, or overlapping fragments of the chromosome and then interrogate each of these fragments for the uh, genes that it contained and then take each of those genes and sequence them and look for evidence of mutations in that gene that were present in individuals who had the disease. Most of these genes, including this one here, S182, which was the code name we gave it, had never been described by biology previously, and their function was not known. During this time, as the hunt progressed to find that actual gene, Charles himself became ill. He developed pancreatic cancer. And towards the middle of the spring of 1995, 
uh, we began to get messages from Charles himself and from uh, Dan Pollan that it would be nice if we hurried up a bit and found the actual gene. By the April of 1995, we actually had a fairly good idea that we had found the gene causing Hannah's illness. But we weren't entirely sure. And a few more phone calls were made to emphasize that Charles' mission in life had been to find this gene, to find the cause of um, the illness that affected his family. And so one day, late in April, when we were quite sure that it was correct, we called Charles and told him uh, this good news. We weren't actually able to speak to Charles himself. He was very ill at that point. But we spoke to his wife, and the following morning she called and told us that he was at peace, that he saw a great sense of relief from knowing that his mission of finding the cause had probably been achieved. And indeed, he died a few weeks later, I think, relieved that what he had shown as an important goal for himself and his family had been achieved. We also found that uh, Hannah's gene uh, was also present, the exact same mutation, in another uh, Jewish family living in America, but had come from a different region, from Odessa, meaning this is probably an ancestral mutation that had been shared amongst uh, uh, a Jewish people of uh, 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 Russian origin. The gene in Hannah's family and uh, in that other family encoded a protein that looks like this with several transmembrane domains, a large loop domain here, and then two more transmembrane domains. Within a few weeks, we'd found that there was a homologous protein, which we call presinolin 2, which was mapped on chromosome 1, and it too was associated with mutations that caused Alzheimer's disease. And so this evidence together argued that these two genes likely had a function that related to how, in fact, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease came about. Further work over the next several years elucidated that the presinolin proteins did not act alone but they were in fact part of a high molecular weight protein complex composed of at least three other genes, nicastrin, APH1, PEN2, and uh, presinillin. As we further characterized this, these protein complexes, it became apparent that there were these two very unusual aspartyl residues embedded within the transmembrane domain, which is typically hyperphobic, and uh, it, this was quite noticeable. And indeed, later on, it was discovered that these aspartyl residues are in fact the catalytic entities that cut substrate proteins in the membrane itself. We worked out how exactly this protein was assembled. It was assembled in a very stereotyped way. APH1 and nicastrin, which actually is a substrate binding protein, uh, uh, assemble first as a, a scaffolding complex, and then subsequently PEN2 and the presinolin moiety are added. The addition of this PEN2 is actually necessary for the next step, which is the autocatalytic cleavage of this loop domain here uh, by these two aspartates to generate the active enzyme complex. It also became clear from the work of us and others uh, that uh, this complex mediates the cleavage of type 1 transmembrane proteins. Specifically, these proteins are usually cleaved first by another enzyme. In the case of APP, this other enzyme is called beta secretase or base, and it cleaves a few residues off the surface of the membrane and releases this ectodomain here into the extracellular space. This membrane-bound stub then becomes the substrate for the presinolin complex itself. And what happens is that the cleavage occurs straight through the center of this transmembrane domain here, colored in red. And in so doing, it releases an intracellular fragment called the intracellular domain, and it also releases this transmembrane fragment, uh, uh, the N-terminal fragment of that, that residual stub. As we and others looked into this, it became clear that actually it was not a simple single cleavage, but in fact was a series of very complicated cleavages uh, done by this enzyme. There was one that happened, uh, uh, the initial cleavage, which happens very close to the inner leaflet of the membrane. There are then uh, another cleavage, the, the zeta cleavage, which generates two smaller fragments which are degraded. This fragment here, as I pointed out, is released into the intracellular space and typically is translocated to the nucleus where it activates gene transcription. 
The final cleavage is the gamma site cleavage, which, which liberates the N-terminal fragment. And for most proteins, this N-terminal fragment is biologically inert and is usually degraded. However, for APP, as we shall see shortly, it is in fact the motor that generates the amyloid uh, and probably initiates the disease. Indeed, to reiterate this now, for uh, uh, the APT protein, there's this initial cleavage by base, which liberates this fragment. The subsequent sub of APP, uh, APPC100 fragment, as it's called, then undergoes cleavage by the precedent mediated uh, 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 endoproteolysis, liberating AICD and this amyloid component here, which then uh, it tends to aggregate and to precipitate into uh, the uh, uh, form the amyloid plaques. I should point out, uh, just going back to this, this previous thing, that there are two types of cleavage, and it seems that uh, if the uh, substrate protein is presented in one phase, uh, that a series of cleavages occurs at residues 40, 48, 50, uh, 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 and 50 there. However, the, sometimes the substrate is swirled uh, uh, by half a rotation, and a minor set of cleavages then occur at residues 42, uh, 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 49, or 50. And uh, it turns out that the A beta of species that's generated on this minor cleavage product ending at residue 42 are much more prone to aggregate and are much more neurotoxic. As we looked at this, we and others showed that uh, the effect of mutations in the presenolin protein was to promote this minor set of cleavages which uh, generated uh, A-beta-42, and in doing so, they increased the amount of A-beta-42, which is neurotoxic. And therefore, it seems that very subtle mutations in the presenolin protein alter this balance between A-beta-42 on the minor cut site and increase it, uh, uh, making, therefore, overproduction of this neurotoxic species of A-beta peptide. That's probably sufficient to explain how the presenolin mutations cause uh, increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. However, it is clear from what John told you already that the presenolin complexes cleave many other uh, uh, transmembrane proteins, and some of those other membrane proteins are in fact uh, themselves AD-related risk genes. For instance, SOL1 and TREM2, which you just heard about uh, from, from um, uh, John, uh, are also uh, cleavage product or, or substrates for the presenolin complex, and if so it is possible that perturbations in the cleavage of these substrates also adds to the way in which uh, people with PS1 mutations get Alzheimer's disease, and it may therefore be this complicated additive effect. Uh, uh, it may be the explanation for why the forms of Alzheimer's disease associated with PS1 mutations in uh, the, this complex are particularly aggressive. So now, in the most recent past, the questions have turned slightly now from how do these mutations uh, cause the disease to now how does the complex work? How is it that these uh, substrates gain access to the catalytic site? Uh, what are the mechanisms by which uh, inhibitors, uh, 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 what are the mechanisms by which these different cleavage events occur? And how can we use this knowledge then to design selective inhibitors that could be used for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease? And in order to do this, we began to build a molecular uh, a picture, uh, a, a, a structural picture of, of the actual uh, complex itself. So we isolated these complexes and we spread them out on a carbon grid and we visualized them uh, using um, uh, uh, electron microscopy. And each one of these fuzzy, very small, nine, uh, 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 nine nanometer uh, sized uh, um, uh, uh, little uh, uh, formations are in fact a single presenolin complex and they fall on the grid in various different ways, some on their sides, some on their head, some on their bottom and by taking these uh, images, uh, uh, each one representing a different way in which the, the, the complex has fallen and taking these images and then sort of re reverse back projecting them onto the um, onto a 3D image, one's able then to recapitulate what the image, what the complex would look like in three dimensions. 
And doing this, we've been able to show that, in fact, the complex is formed like a little snowman uh, with a body here and a head here. Uh, there are some interesting features. There's a central cavity with a pore on one side and a cleft here. And the significance of this cleft is, uh, uh, as you'll see in a minute. So this is a, a, a rotating view, and you can see the cleft here uh, and this central cavity and then this head domain here. And we've been able to take this and realize that this part, uh, um, the body domain, is in fact um, part of, of the, or contains these transmembrane domains, and that this head domain here contains the ectodomain of nicastrin, which is heavily glycosylated. And we can prove this uh, by showing that antibodies to this uh, uh, ectodomain here bind to the head and make it bigger than the unlabeled complex here proving then that this is the orientation of this complex. So the next question we asked was how do some inhibitors work? And there are basically three or four different types of uh, uh, inhibitors. Some of them are uh, rather boring. They simply bind to the active site, and that's not very interesting. Some of them, however, look like peptides, and they don't act at the active site. They act somewhere else. And we began to realize that we could use these peptides as uh, 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 tools to understand how the complex works. Specifically, we think that what these peptides are or do is that they get into the pathway in which a peptide substrate would normally take, and then they get stuck and they block the enzyme. And so we began to sort of work on this idea that if we could use these peptides, we may understand something about the gate mechanism that allows uh, uh, peptide substrates to get in uh, uh, and uh, access the active site. So we began to, uh, to work on this, and we, we made a couple of observations. First of all, uh, uh, it became clear uh, that uh, using selective detergent solubilization, that in fact uh, uh, the complex functioned as two half complexes, uh, one here and one there. And we also realized that uh, the substrates bind to the edges of both of these two complexes, or these two hemicoplexes as seen here. So it binds at this interface between these two. And that suggests then that this interface is a critical biological uh, space uh, f during which important things happen. The next thing we realized was that the binding of compound E uh, uh, caused some obvious structural changes in the complex and probably caused it to be compacted. And we could show this by adding the complex uh, by adding the enzyme to the complex and then noting that if you had two fluorescent tags that they would uh, exchange energy between them more efficiently in the presence of this uh, uh, small compound, meaning that the compound had caused them to come together. And we could show again that this was the case. We also showed that if you added these compounds that what happened was that if you increase the amount of compound, you decrease the amount of uh, substrate that bound to the complex. In other words, what was happening was that uh, uh, the compound E was binding to the complex. It was causing the complex to shut, probably the lateral gate to shut, cl closing off the substrate binding site. And we could visualize this uh, uh, anatomically at, by, at the electron microscopic level, at 50 nanostroms, uh, by showing that uh, the, in the presence of the compound E, this complex had changed its shape slightly, uh, the lateral gate had closed, the, 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 the pore had closed, and the head had rotated. And you can see it here, comparing these two things. Here's the lateral gate cleft, which is probably also where the substrate binds, and when in the presence of the compound, this, this uh, cleft is closed, uh, the head has rotated, and this pore has also closed off. So this began to tell us then a tentative model of how uh, uh, these inhibitors block a substrate access. Basically then, they bind, they close the lateral gate, the lateral cleft, and then the substrate comes along and goes boink, unable to bind, and, and reflects off the complex. So that's how these work. They work by uh, altering the structure of the complex and closing off that binding site. But we also realized that there was an interaction between the substrate binding site inside the molecule and uh, uh, the substrate binding uh, uh, site uh, on the surface of the molecule. And that specifically, in the presence of uh, 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 a non-cleavable substrate, you could show that there was increased binding of this inhibitor complex. 
And so what we thought was happening is that in the presence of this uh, 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 substrate, it binds to the complex and it causes the complex to open up slightly. And so you can now begin to put these pieces of information together and, and get some idea of how this, uh, this, this uh, uh, insidious uh, little molecule, uh, molecular machine works. So substrate binds at the surface, uh, the interface between the two hemicomplexes here. And when it does so, it causes the complex to open up, essentially opening up a, a, a translocation pathway. And the substrate then uh, moves forward into the complex. As it does so, it crosses the compound D binding site, which causes the uh, uh, substrate uh, a binding site to close behind it, sort of acting then as a turnstile or lateral gate. The, the substrate is now encapsulated inside the complex, uh, and uh, in that hydrophilic environment now, uh, the, the reaction is able to occur. The substrate is cleaved, the pieces fall out, and uh, the enzyme recocks and starts again. And it can go on and on doing this. So let me conclude by sh showing you that, that there are uh, uh, some obvious, rather dry, uh, technical advances that have come from this long thread of research that started with Hannah and ended today uh, in Tel Aviv. It's clear, I think, from what I've showed you that the Priestland complex is a, a, a dynamic, small machine whose structure is uh, such that it forms this very atypical enzymatic activity of cleaving membrane proteins within the hydrophobic environment of the transmembrane domain, allowing them to cut uh, uh, key proteins in a way uh, that's needed for signaling uh, throughout life. And this is the basis of how uh, bacteria and humans send signals within cells by cleaving proteins like NOTCH and liberating that intracellular domain which goes to the uh, nucleus. It's also clear from what I've told you that subtle changes in the shape of that machine that are induced by mutations alter the way in which some of the substrates are cleaved. And in the case of the amyloid precursor protein, what it does is it favors the production of a slightly longer minor species which is prone to aggregate and is highly neurotoxic. And it initiates the processes that uh, 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 John has told you about that activate a cascade of events that leads to neurodegeneration and to the clinical phenotype of Alzheimer's disease. What I've also shown you is that we are beginning to understand at a structural, physical level how this complex works. And I think this is going to help us in the future uh, understand how the disease comes about uh, and bring hope, uh, uh, which I think is uh, the gift of Hannah and her heirs, it's the, it's the hope that by understanding how this complex works, we can then design treatments that will specifically inhibit the production of neurotoxic A beta peptides while not interfering with the normal function of this complex. I think, however, that there is a larger lesson to be learned from this story. I think the story tells us that simply horrendous things can happen to humans through disease, through religious persecution and genocide. And this is clearly what happened to Hannah and her heirs. However, I think you can tell from the story of Hannah and her heirs that uh, by showing a massive amount of persistence, a huge amount of stoicism and bravery, a strength of character, a trust in their faith, trust in their community and a trust in their family that they were eventually able to prevail against this and I think that's true not just of Hannah and her heirs but also for humanity. I think also Hannah's uh, uh, heirs who continued this fight against this, who continued to bring the problem of Alzheimer's disease and the problem of their family to uh, uh, medical attention, despite the fact that in the 30s and 50s, wherever they tried, they weren't able to get help. But they felt, uh, people like Charles and Bell, felt that moral in, uh, obligation, which I think is a human obligation, to fight against not only the disease, but also all of the other perils that that family went through. And I think it would be interesting to ask, if one could, back in time, what would Hannah and Slomo have thought of the story that I've told you today? 
It's a story that started 170 years ago, a story that's crossed 18,000 kilometers of space and has ended up being all about very subtle changes in a 90 nanometer a small molecular machine. I don't know what they said. I don't know what they would think. I couldn't speak to them. I can't speak Yiddish, nor even Hebrew, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but I think you can tell from their actions that they would have probably said, remember the past and believe in the future. And that's subtly uh, correct, not only about their particular story, but also about why memory is important, why understanding and treating Alzheimer's disease is important, and why science is important. Remembering the past, understanding what has gone on, and then believing in the future that we can change these things, I think is a wonderful message that comes from Hannah's story. So let me close by pointing out that this wasn't just my work, but was in fact the work of many others through uh, uh, several decades of time, funded by several different institutions. Uh, and uh, finally, let me thank uh, Professor uh, Amos for his help in translating my slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, wonderful talk and link to the history, the past, present, and future with a lot of hope. And we are moving for our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Danny Michelson from the Department of Neurobiology, the Life Science Faculty in the Sagol School of Neuroscience. Professor Michelson is the incumbent of the Lebech Chair of Molecular Degeneration. His research focuses on the mechanism of action of molecular and environmental risk factor of Alzheimer's disease with particular emphasis on sporadic Alzheimer's disease and on APOE, which is the most prevalent genetic risk factor of the disease, as we heard. And Professor Michelson is going to uh, move us from genetic and to mechanism that uh, Peter spoke to translational aspect. He will speak about translational Alzheimer's disease research at Tel Aviv University. Please. Distinguished laureates, ladies and gentlemen, in looking at the laureates, especially John, if I may say so, and the way I'm dressed, I'm reminded of a story of two chimney cleaners who came down from cleaning the chimney. One was dirty, one was clean. And then what happened was they looked at each other and the clean one washed and the dirty one remained as he was. So I am dressed in the British European tradition of honoring the laureates, and the laureates are honoring us in being dressed the Israeli Mediterranean part, and I think this is a nice change. So that's just in a word of opening. Um, how do I start this? No. I can't give the previous talk. It was very good, but I can't do it. Okay. Well, the word translation, we all know pretty much in the context of languages, to translate from one language to the other, uh, but actually translation has a broader meaning and it really means to, to switch from one set of values or system to another. And what I wanted to tell you today is to our translation related work. What do we mean by translation? Science in general and Alzheimer related science in particular has a lot of the focus is on understanding, understanding how it goes, how it works, what is going on. And the word translation means to translate from understanding to doing. Now clearly doing is related to understanding and understanding is related to doing, but the word doing means that you focus your work in trying to apply what has been studied and so elegantly presented in the previous talks to try and apply it to something which can be translated to the patient bed to help the patients. So this is what translation research is all about. Now, this is who we are. There's an amazing group of 12, I think, or so uh, independent research groups at Tel Aviv University who work on Alzheimer's. And if you feel my voice quivering, it's not just because I'm excited on this occasion, but I'm always afraid that I missed somebody. Okay, the list is so big, and I made all the efforts I can not to miss anybody, and I hope I didn't. So what you have here is many names, and you're clearly not supposed to read them right now and see who they are, but the general idea is to see that there's a big variety of things. And my duty here today as a representative of this team is, or this super team, is to present their work to you and to show you what they're doing. 
And I can give you the bottom line at the beginning, which is always good to know, which the bottom line is going to be that we are very heterogeneous. Because like many other people, we believe that there's not going to be a single bullet target treatment for Alzheimer's. This can be debated, but I think there's a lot of examples in other diseases that this is not going to work. And because of that, we think that one should have a heterogeneous approach and trying to hedge your bets so that you can take whenever a breakthrough comes, you can jump in that direction and have the background available. So the name of people that I'm showing here I've decided to break them down by discipline rather than by alphabetic order the way they were before. And the first discipline is people who will be working on the amyloid beta, or as we call them, the Baptists. They are the people who are devoting their work in the lab to A beta as a focal point, A beta and priscilline as well, trying to see what they can do about this and help the patients. The second group, uh, whose names are mentioned over here, they are of another religion called the Taoist. They represent people who work on Tao, which is a major pathological hallmark of the disease, and I will show you some of their work related to the possibility that we can interfere with the disease via the Tao window. The third group, which I belong to, is agnostic, and we believe that maybe focus should be gone on APOE4, which has been mentioned in the previous talks. So in addition to these three religions, which take place at the university, we also have people who say, don't focus on a molecule, focus on a process. And as you've heard in the previous talks, oh, sorry, did I show that? Yes. Don't focus on a molecule, focus on a process. And these are people who work on inflammation as a focal point in which you can do something about the disease. So what I want to do is share with you very briefly what those people are doing so you get a feeling that we're working on a very heterogeneous mixture of complementary approaches. So the first person I want to mention is Becca Solomon, who is not here, but she's the grand dame of Alzheimer's research at our university. She was one of the original pioneers in taking the immune approach to dealing with A-beta problem. So her work was to try and take what you've seen before, the amyloid, the A-beta deposits, and by introducing antibodies, which are the blue guys over here, to try and dis dismantle that. And just to show that she was really one of the early ones, her work dates back to 96, so it's almost 20 years ago where this thing was pioneered to start. But she's not the only one who works on A-beta. Antibodies are very good, but they're very big, and maybe we want to work also with small molecules. So there's a team in, at the university whose focus is small molecules that can block the activity of A-beta, and this is a very nice and elegant collaboration between a chemist, Udi Gazit, who is dealing with the issue of how A-beta comes together to form those filaments, and a biologist, Danny Segal, who specializes in the uh, animal models, the mice and, 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 and the fly. And together what they're doing is testing the ability of small molecules to interfere with the formation of A-beta and to help the, uh, the models. And one slide just shows the sort of results that they get. This is a, a, a fear response of a normal mouse. High means it's afraid. And when you take an Alzheimer's mouse, it is less afraid because it does not remember what to be afraid of, and you can cue this thing with, uh, with, a, um, with, a, with a drug. So this is, what, I'll skip that. So this is what I wanted to say about the, about the Taoist, I'm sorry, the Baptist. We have uh, several groups focusing in this direction in different complementary approach. Now how about the, the Taoist? The Taoist, I will first uh, mention the work of Hagita Dao Finkelman. She focuses on the enzymes that interfere with Tau, which is GSK is one of the main, major, uh, GSK3, one of the major enzymes, and the philosophy of their work is to try and develop small inhibitors that by interfering with this enzyme over here, shown over here, can prevent damage in the model and help the mice, and they have some interesting results showing that this is indeed the case, that, uh, sorry, I'll go back, uh, Ilana, your turn will come in a second. Uh, okay, so she has those inhibitors that block the activity of the enzyme, and she can show using these inhibitors that if you have a behavioral test, that again, high value means that the animal remembers, and this is a model which does not remember, and when they give the treatment, it helps. So, in addition to uh, Hagit's work, 
uh, Ilana uh, Gozes, who uh, is here with us, has pioneered a lot of the work on Tao, but her work really, when it started, did not have the philosophy, a Tao philosophy. It was not a Taoist approach, but it was trying to look at cytotoxic molecules and trying to figure out mechanisms of cytotoxicity and protection, and she discovered two molecules which are shown over here, and when studying the mechanism, realized that these molecules, which were got into the game as a protecting agent are really working with the cytoskeleton so they are Tao related. So she belongs to the Tao religion in, in that uh, way of thinking. And her, uh, her small molecules, what they can do, this is shown here in real patients actually, when she, uh, this is a um, cognitive performance test and you can see here high values is good memory and value, low values is less, and only the group that gets her drug can improve the memory, and this is in early Alzheimer's patients. So, so this is what we can say about the Taoist. We turn now to the agnostics, and the next slide shows a famous agnostic guy called Alan Roses. Unfortunately, he's not a member of our faculty, but I think he deserves a slide to show his work, which has been very important and has been mentioned by uh, other speakers. So what he has shown, that 60% of the patients, that's a very high number, carry this very specific form of APOE called APOE4, okay, as opposed to 20 or so of the normal patients. But not only that they have it, but it correlates with the clinical situation in the patients. So if we take a group of patients, many patients, different uh, variety patients, that all of them at the age of 60 were still normal because the disease starts later on. And then we look at the patients as a function of the presence or absence of those APOEs. You see that the green lines, these are patients that had no APOE and the disease started at the age of 90. Whereas if you're unlucky to have a double uh, dose of APOE4, the disease will start 20 years earlier. So this is a very... Uh, uh, prominent risk factor in the disease because of the high numbers and the high clinical effect. So uh, some groups, in particular our group, is focused to work on this, uh, on this uh, issue. But one thing to think about, when we say that a gene is bad, we have to make a Talmudic argument. Is it bad because it's bad, or it's bad because we lack a good thing? That's a very different story altogether. So look it over here. Here's our happy good APOE. Here's one possibility to be a bad APOE. The bad APOE has some token, some negative thing added to it, a headache, and that's why it's bad. But on the same logic, a bad APOE could be an APOE that lost something, okay? And this is not, as I called it Talmudic, but it's not Talmudic, it's very realistic in the sense that if this is the mechanism, you want to remove E4. If this is the mechanism, you want to compensate and bring something back. So there is some work at the university that addresses these issues. And, and uh, this is myself, and we are addressing these issues by two complementary ways. We are trying to remove the bad guys with antibodies, and we are trying to compensate by doing a biochemical trick of lipidation to try and bring back some, some of the activity. So, um, so, for example, just to show you a, a, a sort of result that one does, one has the mice, which have the good or the bad APOE, and you can subject them to one test, which is very simple, which I want to explain, called object recognition. The mouse is first exposed to two similar worthless objects, two, box, bo uh, two tins of Coca-Cola, okay? So it sniffs them, and then it very soon realizes there's no, nothing interesting in them. Then the next day, you take the same mouse, you put them again with two objects. One is the Coca-Cola tin. But the other one is, a, no, I wouldn't say Pepsi, but let's say a bottle of some, some juice or so, okay? So if the mouse remembers, it will go to the new one because it knows the old one is of no value, okay? So this is what you see over here. A good mouse with a good APOE goes in preference to the new object, okay? Whereas our bad mouse prefers, does, has no preference, does not go neither to the new nor to the old, but if we treat them with those antibodies, we can re, re, uh, impair the performance. So this is some more data which I will not belabor you. So when we do that, we can see that we can repair many of the features of the mice, both by behavior we can make it to reverse and by uh, doing some biochemical markers. Every slide, every talk has one slide that the purpose is not to, for the audience to understand, but just for the speaker to brag that they did a lot of work. So this is this slide here. So I'm not really attempting to stereotypically explain it, but you see many things are reversed, which means that the activity has been effective. So to, to summarize what I wanted to say, oh, sorry, I forgot a very dear friend who's sitting here. 
Because, you see, it just shows you how self-centered everybody is on their own work. Once I spoke about APOE, I thought I finished, okay? So I, I apologize. And in addition to the three molecules, we have people who work on processes of such as inflammation, and Danny Frankel, who uh, you've, you've seen before introducing the speaker, is uh, one of our leader speakers, and he's studying the role of inflammation, how when something activates that inflammatory system, it can affect the brain and induce a uh, loss of, uh, of pathology from the brain. So this is a uh, work of, of Danny Frankel, and the uh, last speaker I want to represent is Ruben Stein, a dear friend. His, he, his work is actually he did not, he's not, he did not, not start the Alzheimer's focus, but rather he was lo looking at microglia, trying to understand what is wrong in microglia that can affect its function. And this led him to the discovery that a certain molecule called CD38, that the presence or absence of this molecule is key in protecting Alzheimer's models against uh, uh, Alzheimer's pathology. So to put everything together, we, as I said, we have several approaches, and you know life has the problems of the rich and problems of the poor. So if you go to a talk when too much is going on there, you may at the end get lost and say, wow, I don't understand what the thing is. I want to have one question, one answer, one direction. But Alzheimer, we think, is not a simple disease. It's probably a syndrome. And there's many things lying behind the phenomena that the clinicians define as Alzheimer's. And because of that heterogeneity and because of what we've learned from other diseases such as cancer, we believe that there has to be a multitude of approaches at the same time so that maybe the man most successful from them will be effective under some conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny. And as uh, Danny said, in order to understand Alzheimer's, you have to tackle it from many directions. And this is exactly what we are trying to do um, in the Segal School of Neuroscience, trying to understand how the brain functions from many directions. And we have the researchers coming from biology, from medical, medical science, from engineer, from computer science, from linguistics, and from psychology. And this will help us to understand how the brain functions. And with that, I'm going to close the first session. I would like to invite you for a coffee, and we'll uh, meet here at 11.30 again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Miller, for this wonderful talk, taking us back in history, telling us some new stuff that you didn't know about HM. And we are really happy that you're here with us today. And we are uh, continuing and going from memory loss to memory erasure. And the next speaker is going to be Dr. Segev Barak. Dr. Segev Barak is a young scientist and new recruitment of the School of Psychological Science and the Segal School of Neuroscience. His research focuses on the neurobiological and behavioral mechanisms of alcohol and drug addiction. He's especially interested in the role of learning and memory processes in some substance abuse and other psychopathologies. His work and memory processes in alcohol addiction was published in prestigious scientific journals and received several prizes. And he will speak today about where is it? Preventing the relapse in alcoholism by memory erasure. Please. Thank you. First of all, I'm really I feel lucky to be here. Um, speaking after these uh, uh, legendary scientists here. So in a way, what I'm going to present is a bit kind of opposite to what the previous speakers uh, presented because they were working, they dedicated, dedicated their lives uh, to saving rescue in memory and I'm going to show how to destroy or how to erase the memory. Um, and indeed when we think of memory impairments, we usually uh, so we have the normal memory, we usually think of one pole of, of the impairment, which is when the memory is too weak or when we have a memory deficits, and this is uh, what we usually see uh, in Alzheimer's and other dementias and after neurosurgeries that make lesions or so on. The other pole of memory impairments is when the memory is too strong or when we can, what we can uh, call abnormally persistent memories. 
That's memories that uh, are unwanted and we can't get rid of them and we see that in other pathologies such as post-traumatic stress disorder when we can't get rid of, of traumatic memories and they come over and over again and also in addiction and I'm going to focus right now on uh, addiction and especially on alcohol addiction. And alcohol use disorders are uh, among the uh, most uh, uh, serious uh, problematic health problems in the world. It was ranked recently second, I don't know how well you can say it, but second out of all the neurological and psychiatric disorders in terms of the amount of health loss uh, due to the disease. The first one, by the way, is major depression. And it is also a major economic burden um, to society. The, the costs are enormous. And unfortunately, the pharmacotherapy for alcohol use disorders is not very effective uh, right now. Now when we take drugs or when we, take, uh, when we drink alcohol, even in the very first time, there are changes in the brain. And these changes in the brain are what cause us to act differently, per, uh, perceive differently, feel differently, and so on. But in the first times, it's usually uh, uh, transient effects. There are changes, they go out and, and uh, we're done. But, with the repeated uh, chronic and escalating use of drugs and alcohol, usually of, of excessive amounts, there are uh, long-term changes. Uh, sometimes uh, these changes are permanent in a wide spectrum of aspects from behavior to brain circuits, uh, neurotransmission, the biochemistry of the brain, and to the molecular level and gene expression. And these changes might cause, uh, they mostly happen in the system of learning and memory because that's the system that uh, addiction share with the normal uh, brain function. And they may cause uh, memories that are related to alcohol or to the drugs to be abnormally persistent. And uh, one of the worst problems in, uh, in addiction is relapse because most people uh, that are addicts try to get abstinent at some point but uh, 60 to 80 percent of them will relapse within the first year and in fact about 50 percent of them will relapse within the first three months after trying to get abstinent. Uh, so um, the main causes of relapse are uh, some stressful event but also uh, what we call cue-induced craving or in other words memories that are related to alcohol, these abnormally persistent memories. So when a patient is trying to get abstinence uh, he might encounter some uh, cues, memories that were previously associated with the reinforcing effects of alcohol, such as passing by his favorite bar or the bartender or people that he used to drink with or simply smelling or tasting a little bit of alcohol. These may all cause very strong craving, evoke the, the persistent memory and cause very strong craving and therefore also lead to relapse. So the rationale behind what I'm trying to tell here is that if we can somehow get rid of these memories, we might be able to get rid of relapse or at least attenuate it. And of course, the question is, how do we get rid of memories? So in the um, psychology uh, clinic, there are two main uh, behavioral methods to uh, try to attenuate or get rid of memories, cue exposure therapy and aversion therapy. In a cue exposure therapy, the patient is repeatedly exposed to the cue, to the, the uh, stimulus that evokes this craving, such as the smell. He repeatedly exposed to the smell of alcohol without, uh, uh, given, without being given alcohol itself. So eventually the uh, craving decays. However, studies have shown that, uh, in fact, this is not an unlearning process or uh, um, erasure of memory process, but rather uh, two memories are created. I mean, the, the previous memory is still there and there is another memory now, so the cue evokes both memories and we have a competition between them on the uh, behavioral uh, expression. And as long as the cue nothing association wins, we have no relapse, but under some circumstances, the Q and previous reinforcement uh, association wins, and then we have relapse. And the same goes for aversion therapy. In an aversion therapy, the Q, the smell of alcohol or the, the pictures of the bars, are repeatedly uh, um, paired with an aversive consequence, such as something that causes nausea or uh, an electrical shock. 
However, still we have the previous memory of the uh, queue and their enforcing effects, and therefore we have a competition, as, uh, and as in any competition, sometimes you win, but sometimes you lose, and there is relapse. So these two strategies have limited uh, uh, successful rates to prevent relapse, and we are looking for something uh, that will be more successful by erasing or preventing the, uh, or disrupting the very initial association between the queue and the reinforcing effects of alcohol. And of course the question is how. So for that I will briefly present uh, a model that was introduced uh, 35 years ago by Donald Lewis. Um, so it, it starts with uh, uh, the new information that, uh, that enters the system into the brain, into the short-term memory uh, uh, that Professor Milner was uh, speaking of a few mo uh, moments ago. So when we learn a new piece of information, it goes into the short-term memory or working memory storage in an active state, a few seconds, a few minutes sometimes, and then some of it decays and some of it is consolidated and moves transferred into a, a long-term memory storage where it's uh, stable. And where, when it's stable, uh, the memory is stable, uh, people thought that it can stay there forever and for a lifetime uh, it, cannot be, uh, um, it cannot be erased. Now, Lewis suggested that when memories are retrieved, the memories are actually reactivated, they become active again, and when they are active again, they are also changeable and level. And it actually makes sense because sometimes we need to update the memories. When you entered into this room this morning, you knew something about memories, now you're updating your knowledge about memory, and then after you're done with that, the memory is reconsolidated or restabilizes and moves back into its stable inactive state and so on. When we retrieve it, it's becoming active and level. When we are done with that, there is a reconsolidation process and it's restabilizing again. Now studies uh, since then, especially during the last uh, decade or decade and a half, found that there is a window of opportunity and it's important to, to uh, say that it was found uh, in uh, a wide spectrum of mammals from uh, mice and rats to monkeys and also in humans that this uh, window of opportunity that we call the reconsolidation window lasts five to six hours during which we can manipulate the memory and after that the memory is reconsolidated and is uh, uh, becoming inactive and stable. So if we are trying to manipulate the memory after that, after the six, uh, the six hours, we can't change it anymore because it's already stable. And this allows us to uh, try to manipulate or interfere with the reconsolidation process and if we succeed, we might by that be able to uh, prevent the stabilization and the memory will be erased. So it seems that memories can be attenuated or erased and one of the most robust findings, most of the studies were done in, in animals and most of the studies were done in fear memories, one of the most robust findings was that reconsolidation process depends on the synthesis of new proteins, the creation of new proteins in certain brain regions that are related to memories, uh, among which the hippocampus and the amygdala that uh, uh, Professor Milner just mentioned. So we chose to focus on a protein called mTORC1, a mammalian tar target to rapamycin complex 1. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about the protein itself, I just uh, want to mention that the protein, this protein controls a system that uh, synthesizes or creates uh, um, proteins, new proteins in the brain directly in the conjunction, in the junctions between neurons which are called synapses. Uh, so neurons communicate with each other through these synapses and creation of proteins in these synapses are very important for the learning and memory processes. And indeed the mTORC1 uh, protein is implicated in learning and memory processes. And luckily we have a drug called rapamycin that uh, we can use and this drug inhibits and prevents the activation of this protein and therefore prevents all the cascade and uh, can interfere with the learning and memory processes. So the first thing that we ask is whether when we retrieve memories that are associated with alcohol when they are already uh, uh, well consolidated uh, memories, if we retrieve them whether we see activation of this protein of mTORC1 and 
uh, we did not do these uh, experiments on uh, humans, but rather in a rat model. And we first trained the animals to drink very high levels of alcohol um, uh, in uh, the home cage in a procedure called tubal choice. They had one bottle of water all the time, and every other day they also received a bottle of alcohol of 20% solution of alcohol in drinking water. It's a little bit bitter and not too tasty, so they start with low level. And with time, they, they escalate and drink very high levels of alcohol and reach very high levels of blood alcohol concentration. And after about two months, we switch them. We put them in special chambers where they have to press a lever three times in order to uh, um, uh, an alcohol reward to be delivered into the chamber and they can drink it. So then they have to work for the alcohol and they press pretty well and uh, drink uh, high levels of alcohol there as well. After about a month, uh, we subjected the animals uh, for 10 days of abstinence. This models the abstinence period in humans. And then we reactivated the memories or retrieved the memories by placing the animals in the same chambers, the context where they drank the alcohol. This is the bar for them. And we also gave them a small drop of alcohol just to remind them of the smell and t uh, of alcohol by the smell and taste. So this is supposed to activate the memory, reactivate the memory, and to initiate the reconsolidation process. And we wanted to see if this protein is activated during this process. So we scanned the old brain, and I'm not going to show all the data. Uh, but just uh, one region, and this region is called the central amygdala. So the central amygdala is a region that is known to play a role in uh, anxiety and in fear, but also in learning and memory. And uh, what you can see here is a picture from a brain of animals that were not, of an animal that uh, did not retrieve the alcohol associated memories, whereas this memory retrieved the alcohol associated memory. There's no alcohol on board, just the retrieval of the memory. And you can see here, I hope, the red staining. This is the central amygdala where the M2C1 uh, protein is activated. So we knew this protein is activated. And the next que question that we asked is whether if we prevent this activation, we can interfere with the reconsolidation process and make the memory disappear, not stabilize and disappear, and therefore we will have less Q-induced craving and less relapse. So we trained animals once again in the same procedure, drinking for about three months and then 10 days of abstinence and reactivation of the memory for five minutes. And after that, we injected them with this uh, inhibitor of mTOR-C1, rapamycin, that prevents this activation of the protein. And then the day after, and uh, two days after, and even 14 days after, we tested for relapse to alcohol seeking and to alcohol drinking. So I'm, show, I'm going to show just a little uh, portion of the, of the data. Uh, these bars show how much they press initially to, um, to get their alcohol, and then they underwent the abstinence, the reactivation of the memory, retrieval of the memory, and the injection of rapamycin. Now the blue bars here are the bars of the animals that receive, the control animals that receive the placebo treatment, and you can see that they relapse back to alcohol seeking and to alcohol drinking, and this was indeed paralleled by activation of the mTOR-C1 pathway, this, this protein, uh, in the central amygdala. And when we prevented this activation with the injection of rapamycin, we uh, showed that they did not seek for alcohol at all, and they uh, considerably reduced the level of uh, alcohol drinking afterwards. So it seems that uh, uh, the mTOR-C1 inhibition erases the alcohol-associated memories and can prevent relapse. So just before, oh, okay, I, I'll summarize that and I will say uh, just one word about rapamycin. So uh, what we found, just to sum all this up, we found that the retrieval of the memory, this is already known, the retrieval of the memory initiates a reconsolidation process, a restabilization process of the uh, memories and that this process, uh, in, during this process there is activation of this mTOR-C1 uh, protein that controls the uh, the uh, uh, the synthesis of new proteins in certain regions in the brain, and that if we prevent the activation of this protein of M2C1, uh, we can um, erase alcohol-associated memories and by that prevent relapse. Now just one word about uh, rapamycin, or maybe a few more words. 
Rapamycin is an FDA-approved drug. It is used right now in humans uh, for, uh, to prevent uh, the rejection of uh, kidney transplant because it's an immunosuppressant through this mTOR inhibition uh, mechanism. So the, the plus for that is that it can be used uh, in humans already, and we know it's safe, but the, the minus is that uh, we might have some side effects. So what we're looking right now, uh, on one frontier we uh, are looking, or not exactly we, but other people are looking for more specific uh, drugs that will do the same thing to the memories without the side effects, and that's always uh, something that we want to do. And in the lab we are looking for behavioral uh, methods that we can uh, do during the reconsolidation window, and by that uh, uh, try to erase the memories and prevent relapse. And with that, I would just like to thank my collaborators in uh, UCSF and uh, the funding agencies, and of course, my uh, lab members. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers of the morning session. And I would like to invite you all for uh, lunch and to observe the poster of the students that are uh, presented outside. Some of the posters, uh, as I mentioned, are part of the Teva in Tel Aviv or Tel Aviv, Teva and the Academy uh, collaboration. Thank you. And we meet here at uh, 2.15.